Hi, um, welcome to the International Association of Adolescent Health and the Young Professionals Network. And we'd like to invite you to our, um, we'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on World Health Day. And today's webinar is about the impact of COVID-19 on mentoring, education and training in global adolescent health. And we're joined with Professor Pierre-André Mouchou and David Wasabi. Just a little bit, a little bit about the Young Professionals Network. Um, we are a diverse network of students, trainees and early career professionals um, working within 10 years in your prospective field, um, working or studying in adolescent health. So please um, join us and uh, you can um, visit us on the web website on the International Association for Adolescent Health, IWH website, and um, you can join us online. And we do, um, we will be following through um, in the future with further mentorship um, webinar series. And just to note that our Congress, the 2021 IWH World Congress in Adolescent Health, um, was hoped to be in Lima and Peru, um, and um, it will be a, a virtual um, hybrid um, experience. So you can visit the website and the Congress registration details. And also there will be a prospective um, program for the um, for the World Congress. Um, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar and Shavak will be manning the, the chat box. So please feel free to, um, to leave a message or a question. Um, thank you. So just to let you know that this session is recorded live and for anyone that misses it, it will be on our YouTube. And I'm going to, before we speak to Professor Pierre-André Michoud, I'm going to introduce to you to our first speaker, David Wasabi. And David is a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda, and he's earned his bachelor degree um, from Macquarie University. He's currently pursuing a master's in global health from Trinity College Dublin, and he works as a regulatory officer of the National Drug Authority, where he focuses mainly on pharma vigilance and health policy to promote and protect public health. He is a member of the East African Community Expert Working Group on Pharma Vigilance. And so welcome, David, and thank you for joining us today. Question for you is, why did you choose Global Health? Attracted because of the, <clears throat> of Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's international reputation in terms of academia is outstanding and amazing. So I thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to pursue my career from Trinity or from Ireland. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, so you've come all the way from Uganda to Ireland to study global health. Yes, um, so what has your experience been like studying during these, um, during, during the pandemic, during the restrictions, during the lockdown? Um, well, I have to, I've had to adapt to a lot of things. First of all, uh, well, like any other person moving from one culture to another, I have a lot of adaptation to do. But now this time I have had to do a lot more because there were extraordinary circumstances. So I had to kind of adjust and uh, move with the restrictions that were imposed by the Irish government. Uh, so I've had to do most of my learning online, especially in the second semester. Well, I had some classes, live classes for the first semester, but most of my second semester has been an, an online package. And uh, well, I have had to spend a lot of time on my PC, extra time on my PC. Well, um, that kind of affects my eyesight, then also um, the restrictions that were imposed by the government. I mean, um, they have, they, they led to some kind of isolation, so, so social alienation whereby uh, we had less of the movement to do and to socialize. So it kind of affected my social life somehow. And uh, yeah, and then there was, I also had, uh, it also had an impact on my learning because we had to forego some of the internships 
and placements. Uh, so we have we've had to rely a lot on uh, the theoretical knowledge, yes. which has kind of affected the practical skills, and um, then also the leisure activities, which I would say are also part of learning, have also been affected. Uh, things like student societies and clubs. Yeah, so quite a lot. But uh, that being said, I must applaud the Global Students Union at Trinity, mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Government of Ireland, the International Council for um, International Students, mm -hmm. uh, my classmates and the lecturers that have really helped me to kind of settle in my new environment. And uh, it has been a good experience for me and I really loved it uh, studying in Ireland and uh, being part of the Irish society. Okay so despite the isolation uh, and as was studying from one room it seems that there are people reaching out um, virtually um, and um, would that be your advice for other students coming next year or? Uh, well, um, how to embrace this new way of learning? Hopefully, hope, uh, hopefully by the start of next year, maybe uh, the restrictions would be eased, and uh, maybe uh, we hope that uh, learning would commence like it used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope, I, I we hope that it will be a better situation than we are in. But uh, just in case, they need to do preparation well um, they need to kind of seek some mentorship and uh, learning in, uh, in in extraordinary circumstances and they need to adapt to the situation that will be at hand by the time of their arrival yeah okay thanks thank you davis thank you all right thank you uh, Susan. Thank you. So next I'd like to introduce and thank you um, to Professor Pierre-Andrea Michoud for joining us today. Um, Professor has been active with the IWH since 1979 and the Second International Congress in Adolescent Health in Washington. Um, so welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. So my first question, um, Professor, is can you briefly describe your career as a European specialist in adolescent medicine and health? Um, I have a first comment. I was asked to deliver a talk, okay, or a lecture. And uh, what I have asked to organize, Suzanne, instead of a talk, is an interview. Yes. Uh, so you will ask questions and I will answer. Mm -hmm. And this is a technique that we very often use in teaching and in medical education. I even used that in a Congress. I was asked to deliver a talk and uh, it was transformed in an interview. So it's, it's more lively. And... Um, as the focus of my talk today is mainly uh, medical education, I would recommend to use this technique among others. Now, uh, to come to my career, uh, I hope you see the screen. Um, and I would say the, 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 the beginning of my career was this, a desert. In the 70s, when I started to think of specializing in adolescent health and medicine, there was nothing in Europe. I had heard of a few centers in North America. And um, after having trained uh, for five, six years uh, as a GP, we have a fairly long training in, in Switzerland as GPs. I moved to Canada and I had a two years fellowship in adolescent uh, medicine in um, St. Justin Hospital. But when I got back, it was still a, a desert. Um, so in fact, what I did is that I opened a, a private practice and little by little got more and more adolescent coming to my office. And at the same time, 
I was lucky enough to be able to set up a research group. So I was able to run surveys on adolescent health in my country. And by the way, it's always very useful to have figures, numbers, if you want to convince people around you to build something in the field of adolescent health. So I was able to build a small research group to get some grants to publish, um, which led me um, by the end of the century to abandon my private practice and um, uh, take the, the lead of, um, of a multidisciplinary unit for adolescent medicine and health in the university or hospital. So I've been in charge of this unit for then 15, 16 years. And uh, at the same time, uh, also working on, on research project. Thank you. So this is just to encourage our younger colleagues who may still live in a desert regarding adolescent health to be very persistent over yes. time. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'll go into the second question, if that's okay. Um, so where does your interest for teaching come from and how did you learn how to be a teacher in adolescent health? Um, obviously, as I was one of the first person to be involved in adolescent health in my region, in Europe, I was invited to attend Congress and I learned little by little to present um, my talk in the right way. But in fact, it is when I was asked to become a professor in adolescent medicine in my faculty in Lausanne, Switzerland, um, that I realized that I had not enough experience. So what I did is that I invited a bunch of colleagues, we were about 12, who I knew were interested in adolescent health um, from UK, Germany, Hungary, WHO, etc. And I invited them to attend um, three days meeting in a Swiss chalet that I, I, I had, uh, which is a large one. And we enjoyed the meeting so much that we decided to go on. And that is the way the UTEACH program was founded. And over time, and this is again for our younger colleagues, I have to say that I have improved, I think I have improved myself over time, including the fact that um, I got feedbacks from the audience, from students, from learners in general. Now, let me take a few minutes to show you the, the website of UTeach. Do you see it, uh, Suzanne? Yes, I do. I'm hiding yeah. behind okay. that. <laughs> okay. UTeach is as you understand, European Training in Effective Adolescent Care and Health is an acronym. And uh, um, it's now existing since um, more than 20 years. And it is free for everyone. So for our younger colleagues who may uh, over time have teaching responsibilities, um, it's interesting for them to know that we, they, they, they can find a set of 25 training modules on the site. Um, you have, as you can see, many different modules and for each of these modules, you have a description of the module with learners goals and then training objectives, activities, and you also can access to related slides. Um, and uh, uh, obviously it, it, it can be uh, useful. So um, over time, we have started also to deliver um, um, co co uh, courses, training courses, uh, in, in many different countries, um, in uh, Eastern Europe, 
in Africa, in um, Central Asia, in uh, Middle East. And uh, while we as a group of, of you teach uh, experts were delivering our courses and talks, I think over years we have improved our style. And um, I would like to outline some of our basic educational principles because I think that um, it makes sense for our colleagues to, to hear about our uh, principles. So, first of all, what is good teaching? This is not good teaching. Teaching is not just, you know, giving to the floor a flow of knowledge without any interruption. Teaching is actually reflecting on your learner's needs. So we have really centered our courses, our sessions on what we think the learners want to get, not only in terms of knowledges, but in terms of skills. So we, we always ask about the audience and then we move to defining objectives and then we move to designing um, pedagogic techniques, um, uh, designing slides, etc. But the, the essence is that we, we have to think of the learner. Whereas, as you know, so many teachers arrive in a hall and they just want to say all what they know without thinking of the needs of their audience. A second principle, I will be short, is interaction. You know probably most of you this pyramid and what people retain from a talk or a presentation. Not very much from a single lecture, as you can see, but group discussions, practice is much more efficient, which is a reason why when you organize our courses, we have lots of small group discussions, exercises, role plays, um, etc. Two last comments. First, the slides. Don't forget that you do not need to put on your slides what you say. It in fact distracts your audience. So good slides are sharp, focused, simple, and they, I would say, sustain your talk or illustrate your talk. For instance, if you have a figure, you show the figure and then you explain what is on the figure. Last comment regarding our UTeach principle is the one of the feedback. I told you a few minutes ago that the way I improved myself was through the feedbacks I got. And the kind of feedback you receive um, tackle actually two different dimensions. One is the one of process. Are people happy with uh, your slides, with the way you express yourself, um, what they have learned? The other kind of feedback you get is whether people have really learned something, and this is what we called uh, Somative, um, somative uh, evaluation. So, very briefly, this is about you teach, but don't hesitate to go on the website youteach.com and use it. Uh, we will have also um, in the second week of July, as we do every year. Uh, typical you teach summer school which will be by zoom because of the of the pandemics 
into it. Um, the EU Teach program two years ago, and um, <laughs> I loved loved every every minute of it. Um, and I did bring some of the practices to um, a conference in um, Ascot, short, a few months after it with Dr. Jason Nagata. And the feedback that we got, so we did the kind of the, the speed dating mentoring workshop. And the feedback that we got from some of the students was that they never would have had the opportunity to meet senior mentors because they wouldn't have had the courage to um, come up and introduce themselves in a busy conference. So they had that opportunity, that unique opportunity of, I think we had three tables of um, 12 people. So they had that opportunity that they I never, five separatists. <laughs> so we never had, they, would, they wouldn't have had that opportunity. So it worked really, really well. And that was where we're hoping to carry forward to the Congress in Peru. So um, yeah, it was very successful. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, have you participated in, in many training sessions and congresses in the last year? Well, as you can imagine, it was difficult for all of us. I started with a conference in India by Zoom, my first Zoom conference, uh, which went well. Um, and I learned the day after that the audience was like 5,000 people, which Obviously, I had not imagined at all. Then I have participated in, in other international uh, uh, meeting congresses through, through Zoom. But I think uh, what was uh, more interesting uh, for me as an experience uh, was I was um, asked to deliver a five days course on the adolescent's mental health to professionals in Belarus. And one of the issue was that it had to be delivered in Russia. I don't speak any Russian. So I realized that it was possible with Zoom to deliver a talk with simultaneous translation and with slides that had been translated in advance and to be quite, um, in fact, quite interactive. Um, so that, that, that was um, a crazy experience for me, you know, to deliver a, a course for five days to professionals in Belarus uh, from, my, uh, from, from my home. Um, and uh, we had um, a meeting of the UTEACH experts to prepare and adapt our next summer school to the situation. So, I mean, that, that's, that's enough to, to, yeah. to mention. Okay. Our next question is, um, what were the challenges that you had to face? Okay, let me get back to my screen. Uh, that's it. Um, well, and, and you can imagine that, uh, Suzanne, because you attended, um, um, uh, you teach uh, summer school, um, we like to be interactive. We, we like to move. We like to adapt the tone of our voice. Um, we like to respond to the, the questions of the audience. And uh, this is something that is, is not impossible, but, but fairly difficult. So what I have tried still to apply, especially in Belarus, was to ask questions. And uh, in fact, I had asked in advance the audience to come up with the screens on. I wanted to see the face and I wanted to be able to ask questions to the audience uh, it went fairly well, although some of the people had difficulty with their connection, and so I did not see uh, their, uh, their faces. Um, you can have a dialogue, as we do now. Uh, I even organized a role play in Russian with simultaneous translation. Uh, 
it went well and I heard from some participant that it was hit of, of the whole session. We had several role plays. I used also rooms. You know that uh, uh, Zoom allows you to split your audience in different groups, to put them in separate rooms and then to have them get back and give a feedback which is a technique I also applied uh, in Belarus. And uh, there is another, I don't have time to practice this with you, but th there is another tool which is quite useful, which is called WooClub. You have the address on the slides, which allows you to bring the opinion of people to ask them to vote on specific questions. It's a very interactive tool um, which make uh, the session more lively and that we are going to use very much um, uh, next July during the you teach uh, uh, summer school. Well, I, I strongly recommend um, the you teach program. I loved every minute of it and I really do hope to be back in the sun one day when all this is over. Um, so it, it, except I have to say that for people who are really outside the European time, it might be difficult to apply. I mean, because if they have to spend the whole night on their screen instead of the day, it's not very convenient. Extremely difficult. Um, so my next question, um, how did you adapt your, your teaching training strategies during the pandemics? And do you have any suggestions um, how to teach effectively online, which you have you have discussed? Yeah, uh, I mean, I have mentioned most of the tools that I've been uh, using, but um, maybe what I should mention is uh, the, the the fact that um, um, that. You, you cannot skip the, the, the topic of COVID nowadays if you, if you give a talk, whatever, whatever the circumstances. And I think that the, the COVID, and, and David mentioned that um, uh, earlier, uh, the COVID allows you to touch on T of, of issues and, and topics. I mean, obviously clinical issues such as the, the recent one of of the long-term COVID, which is emerging even uh, among adolescents and children. We have ethical issues, for instance, regarding uh, the, the kind of inequity it brings. And again, David mentioned that I think in, in terms of global health, the pandemic has enlarged the gap between the rich and the poor countries, and even within a country um, between different um, parts of the population. You can focus on school health. Um, I belong to a WHO uh, technical um, advisory board, which is working uh, since several months on the issue of, of uh, closing of the schools versus reopening the schools or leaving the schools open. We know the impact schools have on, on the life of, of children, pupils, and adolescents. And uh, again, there are ethical issues linked with the, the choice that you have to make between allowing young people to live a normal life and maybe having more infections or to close like France did last week the whole yeah. society. Yeah. Um, there are questions regarding, obviously, the organization of healthcare system. How do healthcare system face such a pandemics? And finally, there is the, the whole issue of advocacy. I, I may come back to that uh, later, but um, I've been very... Um, distressed in my country, and I think it's the case in many countries, by the fact that as the most vulnerable people regarding the infection of COVID were older people, young people were forgotten, at least for many months. 
the universities, as mentioned by David, are closed. People don't see them much. Um, and I think that um, it is important for uh, health professionals, for people interested in adolescent health, like we are, mm -hmm. to advocate for the, the participation of young people in the discussion that go on in the society regarding uh, the pandemic. So this is, in my view, something that can be, you know, touched on um, during this pandemic. Yeah. Please, Suzanne. Yeah, no, I, it's something I think that we've all taken for granted with adolescents and children. We just presumed with technology um, but I think something that's really, really highlighted that technology doesn't replace human contact or socialization. Um, so uh, yes, it, it definitely has been overlooked. Um, I'd just like to um, welcome Professor Susan Sawyer um, to ask a question. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne, and warm regards to all of you, and um, particularly um, hi, Pierre Andre, and also David. Thank you so much for joining the, the webinar. Um, I'm just trying to get my video on. Thank you, um, Pierre Andre. You're a huge expert in teaching, including teaching to many different people in many different parts That's of the right. world. I'm really interested in your learnings of the universality of adolescence, adolescent development, what are the common issues that everyone needs to learn. And this is thinking from whether we're talking about a research perspective or perhaps uh, more typically from a clinical perspective versus what is context specific or locally relevant and I, I just would like to draw you out a little bit on on you know your wealth of experience in terms of yeah, balancing fine. that yeah. not just through you teach obviously but through so much teaching around the world well great question um, I said before that when I am or when we are asked to deliver a talk or a session whatsoever we always want to know the best that we can on the audience. So when I teach like in Belarus, which is obviously a very different context and political climate than in my country, I read what I can get in terms of literature on what the situation is, the school system, etc. Okay, to adapt my my presentations. This is one thing, but I would agree that there are commonalities around the world. One of these commonalities, which is often not easy for younger professionals, is how you interview a young person. How do you make sure that this young person will trust you, feel comfortable, give you the kind of information you need, etc. So this is something we never skip. And for instance, in four days, I am invited to the, the National Congress of Young GPs. They, we, we have young IWH, but we have young GPs. And obviously they have asked me to give a workshop, a practical interactive workshop on how do you interview a young person? Um, there are topics that are not specific. I mean, the issue of mental health, for instance, is universal and, and is high on the agenda. And I'm sure that George Patton <laughs> would not object to that. The issue of school health is something you don't skip because, I mean, school is part of the life of young people and, uh, and you can achieve um, much from good uh, school uh, interventions. Whereas in many parts of the world, alas, uh, the functioning of the school is just too traditional. And we know, for instance, the influence of the school climate on the well-being 
of, of pupils. So obviously I'm not discussing eating disorders as I would do in my country if I go to Madagascar. Obviously there are some topics that are relevant because of the epidemiological situation, but in terms of the commonalities, how you deal with the family, the issue of equity, uh, the issue of ethics, which is one of my favorite theme, um, is universal. Could I just follow up, Suzanne? Could I ask one more question? Okay, which is that Flexibility. I, was have, I was only meant to have one question, but I really would like to also um, uh, recognize that, um, you know, obviously IAAH is a, is a virtual organization, you know, we, we are globally oriented and it's fabulous in the chat to have seen so many people introduce themselves and to see where they're all from, which is just great. We've recently formed um, a relatively new education committee and Dr. Um, Risa Turetsky is unable to join us this evening because um, of the time zone differences, but I'm sure if she were here, she would love me to ask, if IAAH could do a single thing in terms of promoting education in relation to adolescent health, what would you encourage us to do as an organization? Are you referring to the education of health professional or the education of adolescents? No, the education of professionals. Of professionals. Well, I mean, I will repeat myself, but we have no miracle uh, drugs against substance use, against uh, violence, against um, um, some mental health problems, not all, we have some medication. But I think that, I mean, if you train as a radiologist, you are interested in tools, in, in technologies, etc. Uh, the essence of adolescent health, in my view, is the kind of relation you establish with the patient. So I, I, I would say what I would expect from all professionals, pediatricians, GPs, gynecologists, etc. around the world is to be able to show empathy, professionalism, with um, young people. This is, this is the way we can support them in developing their, their capacities. Would you agree? Well, I would, but my question to you is what can IAAH do to actually achieve that is what I'm really interested in, in us as a globally relevant organization. But maybe that's um, a challenge for another day in terms of time. Yeah, I mean, um, I can imagine we can provide um, online tools which can reach these kind of objectives. Um, I've discussed that several times with uh, Russell Weiner, whom you well know, who is a UTEACH uh, old member and uh, has uh, I mean, collaborated in the, uh, in the development of a whole set of videos and um, um, teaching tools in, in the field. I must say I favor human, I mean, um, meeting with people in presence. I, I don't believe, I, I believe that tools and online is important and uh, useful and um, this pandemic is, is showing us that it is possible to achieve much with tools, but we, st we still need to, to see us to interact concretely. And so uh, my feeling is that as far as IWH is concerned, uh, we can probably, we could imagine to develop tools, and that you teach is one of the tools, that people can use in their own context. The teaching and, and just, the learning must be contextualized. And I, I just, yeah, and I just noticed in the chat from Joan Walters who had commented and you reminded me about various other online um, 
resources and well and I felt I should um, just acknowledge that uh, there is also a, a free MOOC, a massive open online course, which is open to anyone on global adolescent health. Yeah, I heard, I heard about it as well. Yeah, so there, there are a range, but um, let's let you and I take that offline in terms yeah. of thinking about IAAH. Thanks, Pierre-André. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Nicola Gray to ask a question. Thank you. Hello, Pierre-André. Um, Hi, Nicola. My question is really about the multidisciplinarity of the adolescent health team. I am delighted to see David here, who, like myself, is a pharmacist. And sometimes professionals like us who don't seem to be the core of adolescent health and don't have, you know, any specialty training can feel a little bit isolated. So my question on behalf of, I know that the YPN is incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, and, you know, just thinking about people who are sitting here sort of thinking, well, where are my mentors? I wondered if you'd like to comment on, you know, the, the interdisciplinarity of adolescent health. And for example, you know, who comes to you teach? Who comes to the courses? People may want to, to speak a bit about uh -huh. that. Great question. Um, I did not mention uh, when I presented my, my career, the fact that I had been the Vice Dean for Medical Education in my faculty for seven years. Given my interest, I was asked to be in charge of medical education. It was a great experience. And one of the things I, I did is to introduce the concept of um, interdisciplinarity in the, uh, the curriculum of nursing students, physiotherapists, pharmacists, etc. I absolutely agree with you that uh, this is one of the, the future of medicine, um, especially because the care is getting more and more complex, especially for young people with chronic disorders. So I do believe that we, we, we cannot skip the issue of multidisciplinarity. We have had dentists, pharmacists, nurses, psychologists, social workers in the UTEACH program. We love it. Uh, although I have to recognize that um, we have one or two nurses in our group as experts, but we are mostly doctors. But uh, I mean, we, I, I hope we are very uh, sensitive and interested to hear from uh, uh, other, other field of, uh, of, of or other disciplines, and uh, I would say that one of the the thing that I like in in teaching through you teach is that um, uh, especially in Lausanne when we have the the summer school, we have people from all over the world who share their experience from so different uh, contexts that it makes, I, I'm sure Suzanne would agree, it makes the, the whole course is a, a real um, interdisciplinary, but also intercultural uh, uh, experience. That's and and by the way, it's fun. It's fun. It's not only interesting, it's fun. Yeah. And that's what I really enjoyed about the program was that, you know, we literally there was a student from every continent of the world and there were so many different professionals within the class that I was there that year and um, everyone's titles were left at the door as in we all had an equal platform, but we all learned from each other. Enjoyed that um, and it was a very unique um, way of learning and um, we all brought something very equal to the table. So I really, really enjoyed that. I can comment on that. Um, I mean, it's rather different to teach students or people who already have their practice behind them. And one of the fun, because most of the teaching we deliver actually is not to students, but uh, for people who are already experienced. In some instances, they know more than we do on a specific topic, which is great. You can use their experience. So matching the experience, exchanging the experience, especially if you have an audience of experienced people, is something we like within the, the, the you teach uh, uh, 
every every day work if i can say it this way thank you um so i'm just going to conclude with a final question um for professor um what in your view are the main consequences of covid on adolescents health and how do you think students and young re residents should address them let me get back to a few slides you i don't need to spend time on the consequences of the the pandemics on on the life of adolescents and young adults and david mentioned that before i mean if i imagine david that you had to come to a, a new city a new university a new country and at, at the same time you had to you know stay behind the screen most of the time it, it's terrible it's terrible so this is why the impact of covid on adolescent health was um, uh, still now uh, a bunch of, of good publication uh, especially from unicef that show that and the reason for the impact on mental health is that the poor access to school and education and the increase in inequality i mentioned that before uh, the the fact that the distant contact especially for between peers is 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 something that is not sufficient we also have observed uh, in our country as well as in many other countries the fact that there is a disturbance of the of the daily pattern and of the sleep pattern with some young people spending actually too much time on um, internet and get and and becoming overweight and for young people who already had an eating disorder before it has been a very stressful situation. I would also stress the fact that the pandemic raises question around uh, the wealth of the world. In fact, the pandemic is the result of <coughs> what we as human beings do to the, to the climate. Uh, deforestation etc so um, we have many young people who actually feel distressed not so much by the pandemic itself but what it means for their future and i think that we as adults and the society have to bring answers to this uh, this uh, situation so how to respond to the challenge i would say first as far as possible keep the schools open and uh, i am happy that in our country since a year we have been able to leave the schools open that was a political choice and uh, and the conclusion of the of the who tag is is the same this should be really the ultimate um, um, decision to take when the is worsening obviously for us as health professional we have to think of reaching vulnerable young people and uh, obviously one of the way to to reach them is through website webinar chats and i think that in many countries young people themselves are very creative in um, establishing um, um, ways to support their peers uh, in 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 difficult um, uh, situation um, we have set up uh, online consultation we have set up emergency hotlines in the field of covid especially and uh, I, I think it's really a responsibility of the healthcare system on one hand but for us as individuals to to be as as um, efficient as possible in um, connecting uh, with uh, vulnerable uh, young uh, people i would like to make a last comment 
last year in in october um, i received as other colleague uh, i i received a, a call from a, a foundation in my country project foundation who said we we have given up with the international gathering but we are interested to set up local gathering on specific issues it was in october and i said to myself we have to reflect on the situation of young people with the multi audience and i get back to uh, nicolas question so we have set up a two days meeting zoom meeting with a chief officer in public health with a psychologist and psychiatrist adolescent health specialist teachers headmasters social workers young people and two journalists two journalists and uh, when i had started to work on this um, on this uh, meeting i had not expected an outcome such as the outcome we we had because people were first of all the people were present for four half day sessions without any inter uh, interruption they were on their screen so we saw them they did not respond to their emails or phone or whatsoever they were with us they were uh, committed to finding ways to improve the situation of young people and as an outcome uh, especially thanks to the journalist we were able to have young people involved in broadcast tv radio we had a group of young people who met the minister of education our region we had more and more people aware of the situation of young people president of the country who openly acknowledged what uh, the situation of young people and what they had brought also positively uh, in the, the situation. So I think, and, and this is my conclusion, as health professional, uh, we, we have a, a duty to advocate concretely, not just say we should have young people with us, etc., but finding ways to concretely involve them in the decisions that concern their uh, everyday and future life. So Suzanne, if or if anyone wants to comment on that. Yep, thank you. We've um, ten, ten to, uh, we've had 10 to 12 minutes and we can open the floor. Um, Shavak, if you'd like to take over, is there questions or comments from the, the main floor? I'm having a look at the chat. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Professor, uh, there are a few uh, questions uh, which has been uh, asked to you. Um, are you able to see the questions uh, or should I just read it out? No, I can see some of them. Uh, I think it's, yeah. it's Silvia who says that it's important to have local teaching as it is due to this effort that local critical mass can be built. I absolutely agree. It's what I said to, to Suzanne a few minutes ago. Uh, I think that IWH uh, as, uh, as an organization can maybe produce tools, but uh, as far as the practical teaching is concerned, it is so contextual and uh, so enriching in terms of having people who little by little get more knowledge in the field and and spread themselves the information around them that um, I, I think that the, the 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 response is think globally but work locally this is a, a sentence that is often 
used. Yeah, uh, so, uh, Professor, uh, there are uh, quite a few questions uh, which I would uh, like, uh, it's been asked. Uh, one of the attendees have asked that uh, how your initially research was funded. Was it through private funds or through donations or through grants? Good point. Um, the, 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 the very first uh, survey I was able to, to run was because I had been asked to redesign the school health system in my region. And I said to the people who had hired me, if you want to adapt the school health system to the needs of adolescents, you first have to know the needs of the adolescents and know the situation. So that was the, the first experience. And then I, I must say that um, globally, I was uh, more supported by state agencies than private funds. Um, we have in our country, as in many countries, a national foundation that, uh, you know, uh, uh, support uh, researches uh, after uh, the usual review that you can imagine. Uh, but uh, the, the, govern, uh, the government was interested to, to know more about the, the health of young people. And for instance, um, I, I was, uh, at that time, I was fairly young, but in the 80s, um, obviously one of the crucial problem was the, the one of HIV. And I got lots of money just to understand where young people, um, uh, not, not where, but uh, uh, to, to understand how young people were reacting to the situation and what their behavior was in the field of sexual reproductive health, etc. So you, I would say you can also grab opportunities when you have a, a, a new issue, a new problem. If you are inventive, you can be funded more easily than if you just wait. And for instance, the pandemic currently raises so many questions that I think that it is an opportunity for people who want to build a research field to I mean, to, for instance, very simply, to gather indicators of the health of young people over time, uh, which is not done very well until now. I, I have a question for David. Um, in, in Trinity, um, do, you, do you have any, any program for in, uh, adolescents and, and, and the COVID situation? Uh, well, I have not come across one and, and uh, maybe I'm not inquisitive enough, but, uh, pro, uh, but I know for a fact, I know that the global, uh, the, the graduate student union has uh, a support for students on, uh, on health related issues, especially uh, mental health issues and uh, yeah. So it's your job. You should, you yeah. could <laughs> you could imagine. Uh, I mean, to to run a research with colleagues on 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 this topic because again, this topic is is absolutely cross sectional. I mean, it's you have you have to inquire about obviously health problems but also professional problems people who don't find a job because they have not finished the school who have left the schools because they don't they are lost um, that there, there are many different indicators that you should look at to measure the impact of, of, of covid on the life of young people yeah true uh, very true and uh, like you mentioned that uh, we need to improve on the involvement of the youth in policy and i think that's uh, a key point that is even recognized by the un convention on the rights of the youth yeah uh, youth participation in uh, yeah. policy so, yeah this is the reason why i raised the issue of ethics uh, i mean uh, and and you know that for instance unicef and who now more than before base all their training and their messages and their work uh, 
uh, using the CRC as a foundation, the, the, the Convention of the Right of the Child as, as, as a baseline uh, to, I mean, to improve the situation. We, we are actually submitted a paper, <laughs> Suzanne, to an excellent journal that you know, which is Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. We are currently submitting a paper on the impact of infections, Ebola and COVID, uh, in the light of the CRC, for instance. Other questions? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, there are two, uh, two questions which I guess are connected to the UTEACH summit. Uh, so one is about like, uh, will it be virtual online so that people outside Europe may be able to access them? And uh, other attendees also asking like, what's the criteria to join it? Okay, um, we usually ask, you, you can have a look at the, the website. I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but uh, obviously because of, of, of the time lag, um, uh, people from far will not be able to attend and um, we are not considering to put it as a video uh, online because we feel that the essence of you teach is really what happens during the course uh, and it, it's I mean I, I I can ask the question to to our colleagues it's an interesting questions whether it, it would make sense to have, you know, the, the, the whole course uh, um, in video, uh, we can, I mean, Zoom allows that, huh? you, can, you can record uh, all the discussion. Um, I don't otherwise, think it's the same, just to... Please, Suzanne? Well, I, what did I you don't say, think Suzanne? I, I don't think it would be the same experience because I, I, I have yeah, been there yeah, and um, yeah. I think one thing that it teaches the most is emotional oh, intelligence and how important that is, um, especially working with um, adolescents. And um, yeah. I think it's hard to achieve that by watching and not participating, but that's yeah. just my my opinion. Now, now to, to, to get to your point regarding the conditions, um, we expect people who come to have some experience already in the field because otherwise they they i think get lost in the discussion if they for for for, for instance we we barely have very young students in pre-grad uh, but and otherwise we usually ask people to write a short notice on what they expect why they want to come etc. Um, in the past it has been possible to have around 25-30 people each year, not many more. I mean because it's a whole week, people have to travel, it's not as easy as, um, as for instance just uh, attending a one or one weekend course. So um, Usually we accept uh, all the people. We had many people signaling their interest uh, last year. We, we had to give up like the Lima Congress last year. Um, but uh, we had uh, many people who wanted to attend so that we had considered to have two parallel sessions because we are a group of teachers, so we can, we can have two parallel sessions. We have had that once in the, in the past. Um, Zoom is not a problem, so we will see what uh, happens. So if, if, you have, if people have an interest, they should uh, look at the website and, and, and uh, write messages. I'm not myself anymore in charge of the, the organization. I do participate in the teaching, but I'm not anymore the organizers after 20 years uh, as the, the lead uh, of you teach. 
Uh, yeah, uh, to all uh, attendees, uh, like uh, we know, like we've just gone over a little uh, by time, but uh, we have some great questions uh, here. So just for that, uh, we definitely want to have these uh, conversations going. So we would totally understand if you want to leave uh, because it's gone over time. But it will be great that if you could uh, stay on, though the, uh, the recordings will be available so that are uh, not losing much time, uh, Professor. Uh, there were other questions also that how did you get the medical community? to look at adolescent health with all the seriousness it deserves? Um, I think I, I did not get the point. Can you Sorry. repeat the question? Yes, yes. Uh, the question was like uh, how you got the medical community to look at like take adolescent health with all its seriousness. Ah, okay. Well, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, it's hard to get out of the desert <laughs> that I showed at the beginning, it takes time. Um, let me give you two examples. One obviously is to attend meetings or to be invited to deliver talks in meetings because then you meet people during or after or before the, the, the talk and so you, you spread the information in the community. Um, when we decided to open the unit in Lausanne, I was wondering how we could advertise the fact that we had a new adolescent uh, uh, medicine and health uh, unit, which is multidisciplinary. Um, and uh, one of the things we did was that uh, each week we would invite a set of professionals to come to our units they would present what they do as professionals and we would present what we were expecting to do as well and then we had a, a drink of wine or some biscuits or whatsoever to you know to socialize a bit we did that with the school nurses with the social workers with the teachers with the other doctors etc so you 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 can broaden uh, the information uh, uh, in being uh, in inviting people actively um, at that time um, our doctor colleagues were a bit suspicious to hear about a center uh, at the radio or the TV because they felt that you know we could um, get some of their patients. This is not anymore the case because doctors have come to realize that there are situations that they cannot just deal with and they are very happy, very happy to collaborate with us. So it takes time for you to spread this kind of, uh, of information. But I, I, I can tell you at the beginning, people were very suspicious about me. What is this guy doing? Uh, what uh, what does adolescent health and medicine mean, etc. It takes you some time and you have to be persistent. Um, yeah, thanks so is much it, for... Is it okay with my... Uh, are you okay with the answer? Did I address your question? Yes, I guess uh, the attendee got uh, their answer, but it would be also great if uh, Suzanne and Nikki also want to share their experience, like how they got the like, yeah. medical community to yeah, come together on the adolescent health agenda. Nikki, why don't you say something? Well, I, it was actually something that Suzanne said earlier on that I totally identified with. In my early career, I was a pharmacy politician as you know, coming from student days. And on many of the conversations that we had with other disciplines, there were territory problems, you know, that, uh, and there were arguments. But what really made me think about going into young people's health was that if you put the young person at the center, um, you can lose the, the territory wars. You can lose, just as Suzanne said, your titles are left at the door and you all bring your own contribution to the table for young people. And because I totally agree with you, Pierre-Andre, 
that you know many of my colleagues in general practice particularly you know find that they're not sure how to signpost young people how to really get to the the, the center of their problem because they've got limited time really appreciate the input of other people and so I I'm you know I think you've made really good points and they're mirrored by my experience of you know how to um, you know raise the uh, the profile of adolescent health and how to work on it in a multidisciplinary way and um, I feel like I'm in the desert I love that um, example <laughs> not only do I feel like the desert I feel like I'm 10 foot under um, there's so much fantastic work going on in Ireland, but I think we're all working in silos and I do feel very frustrated that we have, you know, children's health or adult or adult health. There isn't a program in between and um, it's great to meet with like minded people and we definitely need more events like that because uh, at times I get quite disheartened. About but can I just say, Suzanne, in terms of thinking of this as a young professionals networking webinar of the International Association for Adolescent Health, that most of us online at one stage or other have been in the desert too. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the role of RAAH, as I've been posting in the chat a fair, fair bit and responding to various people, is very much to be trying to really help support and build motivation. So Celia Kostela from Finland, who is commenting on the local work that she's developing in terms of running a course in Finland. Diana, who um, has signposted that she had done the, the UTeach program um, uh, two years ago and is very active in the Indonesian newly formed Association of Adolescent Health. And it seems to me that this is where this IAAH can really focus to be a in a sense, to be a coach, a mentor, a motivator, an enthusiast for those of you who are online, and so many of you are online, who are yourself leaders in your local community. You might not view yourself as a leader now, but um, you know, I know that that so many of you looking at you, you're all in, in these leadership positions, and yet so often in your own countries, because you haven't yet developed that critical mass, you can feel remarkably isolated. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think really trying to band together. If you can't find like-minded colleagues locally in your country, that's where you know the Young Professionals Network is available free of charge to anyone. Hop online to the IAAH website. Mm -hmm. There are lots of like-minded colleagues, and many of us can connect you, um, just as we've been doing online in the chat with um, with people in your own countries. Even I absolutely agree that the issue of mentoring is um, is crucial. Um, I was myself happy to meet um, in the 70s uh, and the 80s with a, a person who. Um, was in charge of school health um, and actually um, was a mentor for me um, and encouraged me although he, he he was an epidemiologist he was not a clinician uh, and by the way he was the he was the chair of the scientific committee of the Montreux 1991 Congress, whereas I was the, the organizer. So I would agree that what IWH could provide is um, specific mentorship, maybe in different fields. So you probably had to define the profile of the mentors, depending on what the learner expects uh, if he is working at global health like david or working as a as a as a physician in a hospital or in private practice etc but i think uh, having mentors is extremely uh, useful this happens uh, i'm sure both nicolai and you uh, uh, suzanne we do it naturally with some people who have spotted you uh, and, and and it goes over time. I get mails from different parts of the world, but maybe it might be useful for IWH to structure this issue of mentorship more well, than Well, just to before. signal, and I'll hand back to Suzanne, but IWH has recently got some money to do just that in terms of a more structured mentorship program, so I'll watch this space. 
Yes, I think we have a slide Excellent. to conclude um, the webinar that there is um, a webinar series or um, a mentorship series coming soon, um, which is great. I would like to thank everybody for attending all the questions and comments and thank you so much to David, um, to Pierre, Andre, to Susan, to Nikki and Molly and Shovak. Um, if please join the IWH and um, there's just so many resources there and the Young Professionals Network and the EU teaches online as well. Um, so I might conclude the session. And again, thank you so much. Um, we've had a great participation and attendance today. Um, and please put in the webinar evaluation. It will be linked. Um, uh, it will be sent by email. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.